The director of New York's Hayden Planetarium, cosmologist Neil deGrasse Tyson, is sharing his hunch about whether civilization can survive man-made global warming. What's your hunch? Are we going to are we going to figure out how to handle man-made global warming? I think so. One of the great next frontiers in technology is what's called geoengineering. And these are engineering projects on a scale that influence the behavior of the Earth. Frightening, I, I, though. Unintended consequences. No, well, okay. It's frightening because we don't know how to control it yet. Anything looks frightening when it's not well understood. But you can imagine a world where a volcano is ready to blow, and I'll say, oh, tap it. So you stick a little spigot out the side, out comes some energy. I drive the city with energy from a volcano that was about to destroy it. Take the energy out of the volcano, we're done. It may be that we need some of the gases that are in the volcano for the general balance of the atmosphere on Earth, so we'd have to research that. But not The unintended thinkable. consequences of that. If you live in a world surrounded by scientists and engineers, they don't say, where do we run to? No, that's not their first thought. Their first thought is, how can I avert this? How can I exploit its action for the greater gain of civilization. And that's what we've been doing ever since the beginning of time. And that's what civiliza of civilization. That's what civilization is. It's your ability right. to control your environment in the service of your own your own survival. And in fact, come to think of it, on Nature's Edge, our very first show, we interviewed Klaus Lochner, whose uh, whose office is just up at Columbia, up the street, on figuring out a way to pull a little bit of carbon dioxide out of the entire Earth's atmosphere. It's it's a cleanup job, basically. Yeah. So. Maybe there's a way to rem maybe there's a way to remove the CO2 from the atmosphere, and so in make, the amount we want, in the amount you need, uh, uh, maybe we're not there yet. Our tools don't allow but it. But we're yet. working on it. Tyson says new tools and engineering come after new unexpected science. Most research that's on the frontier has no known application to the quality of your life at the time the discovery is made. So you have people who are driven by the curiosity of the unknown. I like being drawn to where I am most ignorant, and then I'm bathing in places to learn, and in ideas yet to be had and thought. And so it's those discoveries which, when they, they're brought into culture, and you get a chance to chew on them for a while, and digest them, and you realize, hey, this, for example, the inventor of the concept of the laser, was he thinking, you know, this will make good barcoding one day. <laughs> <laughs> the inventor of the laser is not thinking that. The inventor of the mm. laser is not thinking of all the things that lasers do for us today. And uh, another example is the, the magnetic resonance imaging. This is, it allows the doctor to see inside your body without cutting you open. And you say, oh, that's nice, somebody invented that. It was or, or an astrophysicist. Radiating. An astrophysicist? Who who discovered the principle of magnetic resonance, nuclear magnetic resonance. MRIs came from an, one of you guys? Nu <laughs> <laughs> no, but it did. Yeah. It? And the Nobel Prize was given for it. Uh, Ed Purcell is the physicist who came up with this. He's a Harvard physicist. And so is he thinking, oh, we can make a machine to analyze the body with this? No, he's trying to understand molecules in space. That was his big interest. Molecules in space. Huh. I don't want you to have to say, when you're done, show me how it affects my life. If you do that, you're, that's, not, that's not discovery. I don't know what that is. It's utilitarian. It's, it's utilitarian. If you want utilitarian, go hire engineers. That's what they do. They make machines. They take the principles of science and turn them into useful devices. You can't require that of the scientist. That's not the nature of the enterprise. Well, I do notice, Dr. Tyson, that we started in the daylight and now it's dark outside because the sun, you may have noticed, drops behind the horizon. Yeah, I think of it as the Earth rotating, but no, okay. You're kidding. The Earth <laughs> rotates on its axis? Yeah, yeah, I had to break the news to you. Yeah, but then how come we don't get spun <laughs> off? Even that, I discovered, you have to remind yourself every day that the, you guys are telling us, and have been for some centuries, that the Earth is actually rotating under our feet, and that's why the sun appeared to disappear. Yeah, if the Earth stopped rotating at this instant, you would fall over and roll <laughs> due east at 800 miles an hour. Oh, that's good to know. I'll die out on yeah. that one. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're not connected to the Earth at that moment. Dr. Yeah. Tyson, thanks so much for it's a pleasure talking to, to nature. Talk about Zen. the universe in the, what we think of as yes. the center of the universe. Yes, here. indeed. We're out of time. So to all of our viewers from near Ptolemy's hometown, Hermiu, in ancient Egypt, to any aliens intercepting our broadcast out there in the future in space, thanks for watching Nature's Edge. 
And don't forget to check out our website at abcnews.com slash nature's edge. All one word, no apostrophe.